like to thank um, the Good Institute of Ireland and Mark and Sarah. So thank you very much for your support in having us to realise this exhibition. And also Morris Ford, who helped us with the shipping. And as ever, we'd like to thank our funders, the Arts Council. And I wanted to go in what time? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So if, there, if anyone has particular questions about the the way in which Ethan Hopper made her photographs, if you would kind of think of asking Andreas before he goes. But Suzanne is a son of the But you may so far specifically very useful if you have a question towards technique and the real way of how Adam worked because he worked as he started to work as, well as an assistant. So see, he has real close in internal in view into her type of working. That's what I wanted to do. That's the difference between the two of us. I, I never really stand beside her, aside her when she was doing photographs, as he did. But Susanna is, is the expert in terms of the overview of, of Hofer's practice week. Susanna's brought, kindly brought a number of reference books, mm -hmm. which are downstairs in reception, if anyone would like to. Um, the Steidel monograph has a very interesting essay by Susanna. But also, there's a, a piece of writing by Hofer herself, so that would well worth reading. So we just, we'll just start. So, yeah. So would you like to maybe just talk to us about her life, her early life, and her, her work? Um, well, just giving giving um, Andreas a chance, I would appreciate if we could start with some sort of Okay. I mean, how was it that Evelyn would go out, being in a city like Dublin, I mean, you haven't been there, but you have had the experience of really going out into countryside, into cities, with working with people, and how would she work? I mean, how would she be there with well, her big camera? For me, it, uh, it was a really new experience working with her because I had a traditional training in photography. So the first assignment I had with her, uh, that was in Rome, uh, she had to photograph the Villa Medici. Um, she went out without the camera, so I was really surprised to see that. And then she made little notes, we walked around the room. And um, so I noticed that she really took her time for taking her pictures. So the first day uh, was not spent on f uh, taking pictures, she just uh, looked at the, the room, the space, and was thinking about what she can do there. So that was really something new for me because I was used to go somewhere, take the pictures and then leave. So that was really a, a very new approach to me and also it was very important for her that she kept the first, um, her first impression of a place. So she, she always told me it's important uh, the things once you come to a new place, to a new city, um, to uh, to get the first impression, because the more you stay somewhere, that gets lost. So, and that's why it was the hardest book for her to do was New York, because she was living there. Yeah, too close. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about? I mean, we don't get too much into the technicalities, yeah. but the type of camera to use, because that's one thing a lot of people do. Yeah. This morning, you were in to see the show, were yeah. going. They thought it was a Leica mm. that she used, and then they were going. So there are people who have been very interested in how she made her pictures. Uh, well, she she got a training using uh, a Leica and then a, a huge four x five camera. But okay. actually, she never really used a Leica professionally. Okay. She just took it for snaps. So at first, when she started with fashion photography, she used a Rolex Flex. A six by six, but then it turned out that she didn't like the format too much, so okay. she switched to a four by five, and she stayed with Which the four by five. Which gives this format here for people who might not be photography, yeah. you know. And she also did all the portraits she did in four by five, which is, uh, I think, some of you who might photograph uh, might know that it's really hard to 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 focus and then to keep the. Um, the people still. Sometimes she used like half an, uh, half a second for exposure, and uh, 
So it's really a challenge to work with a 4x5, especially on Fortress. So it's a big camera and yeah. it's a heavy camera. And, you and you have to it. use a black cloth yeah. uh, to see mm -hmm. uh, on the ground glass. Yeah, it's upside down, yeah. Yeah, it's upside down. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very true. And it takes, it takes a long time to get one image done. And uh, material is quite um, expensive. I mean, you, you have a limited access to material, specifically if you travel. So that means you rather be very precise by doing a photograph instead of just clicking around as we use it mm. nowadays. Mm. That is one of mm. her goals, uh, used to be one of her goals. I mean, mm. if one has a look to her mm. archive, one really can see that she was careful with material. Mm. But you really worked very precise. Mm. Um, would you like to ask a question? Dye transfer. Yeah. Could you explain that? Uh, dye transfer is, <laughs> is a color process which was firstly, I think in the 40s it was invented. And it was used first for advertising agencies who were using it and then later on photographers were using it. And it's a paper uh, developed by Kodak, and it's uh, it's like a, how do you say what's the, the English word for um, um, seed cook? Uh, it's a silk screen um, process. So there um, are two it's types not, of it, it works like a silk, a silk screen. You have uh, matrices with uh, yellow, magenta, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and blue, and um, they were. Um, they they were put on the on this special paper, and then the dye transfers into the paper. Mm -hmm. So she, did and she go to color fairly early in her career? I mean, did she use I mean, she always um, used color in in She used it very um, um, rarely. I mean, on, just on special occasions like this image. Yeah. Does only work in color, yeah. for example. That's right. So. Uh, yeah. So she was very precise in when she used the color, but... Uh, because my recollection is that color was very unusual for that sort mm -hmm. of work at yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially on the art uh, market. I mean, uh, yeah. photographers yeah. who exhibited, uh, everybody was doing material. black and white. Color was mm -hmm. yeah. um, considered... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for snapshots, know. wasn't yeah. it? At that time, yeah. color yeah. was the kind of commercial, yeah. cheap type mm. of things. Mm. But can you talk a little bit about the, the process then into the book production? Because she was writing, or maybe it was in your essay, about the, how when she was doing the Dublin book, she had difficulty with the printers to get the yeah, there's, prints. There's one story she told me. For example, if you look at that image, uh, which is called Dublin Sky on the left side, um, she had the, um, the printing was done in Switzerland, uh, the very good uh, concert at Kuba, a very good company, and they were specialized in, uh, in that printing process. And so she looked at the proofs, and uh, it turned out that the sky looked completely blue. So she was really angry, and she talked to the printer and said, what have you done to my image? And he said, um, well, I thought poor Miss Hofer, she had bad luck uh, in Dublin. She had bad <laughs> weather, so I tried to improve her, to cheer this image up. So it took her a while to convince him to get the, uh, the sky grey again. So. And it was unusual at the time that she was writing about the house, maybe working in this way was, was uh, coming together of, of both the artistic process, but also the emotional process. Of making photographs, I think uh, it it would be, might be very interesting. People, I know there's one or two people in the audience who actually had are in picture in the images here, which is really fantastic. But what was she like to work with then, as a person? She was obviously very exacting. So could you maybe give us an insight into? The yeah, so she was happened? very strict, uh, also with herself. So yeah. uh, either something was good or it was bad, and the bad things went right into, into the garbage. So. Right. But um, also negatives as well, yeah. But a lot of the eliminating process was done while photographing because we, uh, she was using Polaroid, and so you couldn't really study the comp composition, the light, and everything. So uh, actually, the pictures she finally did uh, were already the ones she she liked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was your role then? Were you? Did you well, I was in charge of. Um, 
the lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes <coughs> he used for interiors, he used uh, strobe light. And then, of course, carrying the equipment. Yeah. So. Uh, the hard worker. Yeah. yeah. So at that time, she, she once wrote in, in some articles, she said, Oh, I don't have much equipment. I just have my camera case with five lenses. Then I have my case with uh, holders. And then I have the case with my straw. <laughs> <laughs> so if you yeah. compare it to nowadays, it's really three heavy cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fine when you're not, when you're hurt. And what was she like um, <coughs> with people? What kind of a personality did she have? Because she writes about, mm -hmm. in the Irish, uh, in the Irish, in the Dublin book, she writes about the difference between photographing established authority figures and photographing mm -hmm. ordinary people. And she mm -hmm. was saying that that only people were, were so it's easier to work because yeah. like, here I am. Well, she always felt that ordinary people were less uh, self-conscious. Yeah. And other people, sometimes they, they ask her, what should I do with my hands? Or yeah. how should I look? Yeah. And so that was always irritating for her. She, she just said, be yourself. Yeah. And so, a lot of the so-called simple people, they didn't ask a lot. They just yeah. sat there and posed. And would she talk to people for a long time or was she quiet? Yeah, people? she was talking to them while setting up the camera. And um, so she, she really got in contact with the people. So she didn't find it difficult? No, yeah. no. Yeah. Interesting. And um, uh, would you mind if I asked you, what, what do you remember getting a photograph taken? Because Anne is one of Anne is the lovely lady over there, um, just beside the two waiters. Uh -huh. Is that there? Iberian Hotel. Would you mind, what was it? Do you remember getting a picture taken? I do. I do. Uh, I was uh, 17. And I don't know if you really had room. All right. With, with um, Ross Arkham. Yeah. And um, I don't really remember much about it. I remember her taking the pose. Yeah. And the housekeeper dressing me up for a And um, I don't think, I think the curtains were pulled, you know. Right. So I can't remember the feelings of that. Um, yeah. So she pulled the curtain, she pulled the light yeah. down the wall. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But, um, you know, she just wanted one of the old members. You know, right. Yeah. She was going to go that. And she put the pose. Yeah. Um, She'd stay there for a few weeks and often went away and she was very quiet. Quiet, yeah, yeah. And did you see the book then when it came out? It was a copy of the book, um, Dublin Portrait, so I'm scared some reception as well, so please have a look at that. Because the text actually by B.S. Pritchett is very specific to the time. He was an English writer and it's it, he's, he's got some choice comments to make about the Irish, so it's, it's, it's worth a read. <laughs> so maybe, uh, how are you for time? Are you okay? Uh, well, I have to leave soon. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So Suzanne, maybe you might talk about how you came to be involved with Ethan Hall. Well, that happened because I am friends with one of the photographers in Germany who um, had been assistant to Evelyn Hofer in New York. And there are quite some of them. They all adore Evelyn Hofer. Um, and uh, uh, have a very high, they really had great time with her because we learned so much. Um, I saw one single photo of hers in his private space being up among many other photos. I would point on that. It was actually a photo a portrait by, uh, of Howard Hodgkin, a painter I do not really like very much, but the photo was just gorgeous. Um, it's a color portrait. And I asked if there was anything else I could see, and I got a very dusty, old, um, uh, antique book, looking for me, antique from Florence, printed in 59, um, and looked at it and just said, listen, is there anything I could see on top of that? So Stefan Erfurt, who is now the director of CEO Berlin, he was the, one, the guy, um, introduced me to Andreas. Andreas and I agreed upon, he lived in, he lives uh, he lived in Munich, I lived in, in Bochum, my gallery is in Bochum. So making it happen to see 40 more pictures of hers, we would meet in Frankfurt in the middle of, of Germany and Andreas would bring me a box of photos. So the time I'm talking about, it was beginning of October, I think, that I saw this one picture. And you were still working with her at that point, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, ever since he, he would. Since 82, yeah. so yeah. it was... Yeah. Yeah. 
So by, by beginning of November or in November, we would meet in Frankfurt in the actually in the restoration studio of the Stadel Museum. Huge, beautiful space, very impressive, it was quite surrounding. I saw the 40 pictures and just said, listen, how can I learn more about her? So next step would be that we would meet mid of January, so within a very short time period, even for a gallerist. Um, we would meet Evelyn Hofer in New York. He would come, Andreas would come to New York, I would be there, and I would have the opportunity meeting Evelyn Hofer there. One has to know that Evelyn Hofer, unluckily, um, had a very short time remembrance by that time, after a heart operation. So what happened was that she, and she never ever would learn that, she did not remember me while talking with me. I mean, you know, you have the situation that you talk with somebody and he, this Evelyn would lose the context within one sentence, which was something she did on such a charming way that everybody had the opportunity to come over it, even she. And you know that people can get quite anxious by having such experiences. The great thing, and I'm very, very grateful for that, was she never, ever had any problem like that about her own work. So she was absolutely perfect in giving her references, having a knowledge about what she liked and what not. Her judgment was impeccable until the almost until the end of her life. And what age was she when you, when you met her then? Hmm? When you met her first in New York at that time, what, what age was she? Um, possibly 77, 78, mm. I yeah. think. Um, <coughs> um, so in that meeting, and I, you never know what happened. I mean, it was a complete new um, situation for me. I never met that lady, and she really was so well educated. Her language was just gorgeous. We, as a gallery, work with Richard Serra. So it happened that we could have, I could take a choice of 99 photos with me out of that situation. And Reyes really made it possible that we put that together. You got this little box for me, which I still have. And um, I wanted to, I insisted on making a contract. And since we were working with Richard Sarah, I was allowed to use Sarah's office and typewriting German speaking into an English, English typing the contract and a list of words. I would do that. You know, I, a nightmare. Think of jet lag and all the other stuff. And that is, so I came back very proud that I had been able to manage this. And you know what? This lady would sit there and say, you know, this is wrong written. Here we have to make a correction. And here, you know, <laughs> like a school teacher. there is something wrong. So it should be, you know, and you sit there and think, oh, goodness. And this really was something you would figure out very, very spontaneously. I mean, this is the pickiness, the preciseness of her mind. Yeah. It's not only her eye, but it's also her mind, which made all the photos as they are. And still, she was a very warm-hearted lady. I mean, she had this incredible, she would speak wonderfully French, German, English, and Spanish. Oh. You know, so, and, and you sit there like a nobody, you know, but being <laughs> unable to, to, to write on an American typewriter, a proper letter, you know. So that really was kind of something. Well, I got home, had this, back with me, 99 photos, got it into the airplane, came out home, and had, I mean, this was by then probably the 20th of January, had taken the decision, luckily this was possible, to have her opening of the show, because I thought, I mean, this lady gets not the answer. She would say, I'm not a young chicken anymore. I mean, so um, she would, we would have her opening then, by 30th of March. Right. So within half a year, this all happened. And uh, this is due to my understanding <coughs> that this is a gorgeous body of work. It's not to be understand why I didn't know that earlier. And as I learned later on, it's not understandable why nobody else knows it. So you know, just, just to kind of put it in context, she wasn't being shown at this point in time. She no, didn't have... She did. You know, a gallery circuit. She was well, she, she had a gallery before in New York. What? A uh, Whitkin well, Gallery, yeah. which was quite well known. Okay. But they they closed, closed down, down end of the nineties. Yeah. So at that time, 
there was no gallery around. Mm-hmm. So without your intervention, then it, it could she, her career could have gone quieter and quieter. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and this must have been quite a difficult point for her, as I understood, because I mean she was <coughs> relaying on, on her professional life. Yeah. And of course you have to make your living. And of course you you, you are somebody and then you seem to disappear. And um, there was something I mean we went on with the work and interesting enough quite a lot of people couldn't believe that they would not know this work and therefore it could not have been a good body of work. So it yeah. took me some years to point this out. I, I mean we have quite some, I'm well connected I would say, and it took until 2004 that we published the book and that, that really was a waking point. So from then everybody of course knew ever since that this is a great body of work and ever since it had not been different, you know, so yeah, they had yes, this yes, experience yes. Um, with, with uh, the reception of Evelyn's work. Yeah. Yeah. And so was she happy then with, with she must be delighted with the book? And well, uh, it happened actually, I mean, I wanted to make this book, I had this idea. I went to Shirma and had a little tiny concept, I thought a book of 140, 150 pages would be great. So I had this, actually I, I worked on a concept which I would present and I even worked on that with Markus Schaden, you all know him. Um, so we, we had the idea, we, we thought about how that could be done. I presented that to Shiro and he would say, well, you know, I have all these young fellow workers. I have nothing to do with this is no way, you know. Okay, good. Next situation I had, I was at Steidl's um, printing shop in Göttingen. And that was because of a book of Lucinda Devlin. And I just announced to Steidel, listen again, I want to have 10 minutes to show you something. Mm-hmm. Had my books, my copies of Evelyn, Evelyn's early books with me, and would put them in front of him. He just went through page by page, and just in the middle of it, I'll do it. Just, I'll do it. And that was one of the next wonderful situations, which really made this, um, I would say, being a success, getting Evelyn yeah. Hofer known. Yeah. Because he really, and I still cannot really believe it, but he really gave me a carte blanche for this book. It's now a book of 357 or six pages. Um, it contains 147 full page, first class color prints. I mean, now we would even do it better, uh, but in 2004. He would not only, I mean, this was really a different point by then, he would not only just have a very wide range of photos um, he would like to show, and I, had, I was very well prepared. I mean, I, I really worked out, we had inch measurements and centimeters, and we had it really not only English and German, we had it American and German, which is, is a job to do. And this all due to, to your work, Andreas, we would have the scanning from the original prints. Mm. So some of them had to be printed. So the prints you see actually here, those prints had been given to Steiber, he would print them, he would scan them. Not only the 147, no, we had something like 180 scans done. And you know what that meant? Money-wise, for example, he really put investment mm-hmm. in it. And he would pay Kim Zicke, uh, he would pay all translations. We had a, a, a very nice combination of authors for this book. For this book. It was gorgeous, just a wonderful relationship to work that out. And the fact that she could write a piece for it as well makes it extra special. Well, that had, had a specific history. Um, we, we figured out... I you have to excuse yeah, Thanks very much. <laughs> See, um, Evelyn did, did for, for a publication in, in the 70s, sorry, mid 70s, 77, she did an essay yeah. on how she works. So all the technical information which are in her essay in the book from 2004 are really useful because he, she really gets a very, very precise information on how she, for example, Anna, she would use the bathroom in, her, in your hotel, in that hotel, to develop all the transparencies and negatives there. That's a security problem. If you travel with them, you never know what happens to them. So they would be destroyed. And that's, that doesn't happen so easily if you just have developed them. So she, she, put, she had all the equipment. She would describe that 
how much time and how she would know and so on. But she also would give, give information on how it was to, to photograph, for example, the, the girl with spice around the Phoenix Park um, in very sharp, short, but lovely sentences. And Andreas and I, I, I would read that, and Andreas would work with me on getting some more information on some other images which hadn't been talked of over mm -hmm. in that essay. So, funny enough, it was that she was in Solu and she used to be in Switzerland over the summer. And Andreas would go there and ask those questions to her and record them. Uh, she would give that in, in German, while the other text was originally written in the base of it, was written in English. And Andreas would send that text to the uh, translator, because now it had to be translated into English, um, to fit with the English text, while the English text had to be translated into German and so on. And she could prove them all. Yeah, she yeah. could prove them all. But this um, cassette never arrived. Oh. So what Andreas did is, he went again and asked her again. And the funny thing is, she gave, she gave the same answers. Right. It really is. Yeah. I mean, she had such a clear idea on things that she almost had a photocopy of her own words in mm -hmm. her mind and could repeat that so that we have this text which now uh, has all the oh. different kind of aspects. We choose different kind of you know, landscape. She would talk about um, <coughs> the Toscana view is a, is a Florence view, which is similar to Dublin, how she would do that and so on. And was she happy then with the printing of the Steisenberg? The or well, did she go back to going? Mm. The amazing thing, I, I told you that she had no short term remembrance. She never ever would really recall me while she would my, uh, remember my husband. <laughs> um, never worked with her, but she, she liked him more. I mean, as a matter of fact, I have to take that. Um, what happened was that Beat Wismar, he was by that time directing Ava and do the show, and he would supply also a text. And she liked him too. She liked Beat Wismar too. My God, no. what shall we say, Anna? I mean, they all were boys, no? Um, so, no chance. <laughs> um, so, what happened was that sometime while we were producing that book, Evelyn, having no Andreas around himself or herself for that moment, would call the Wisma by her own, give him a call and say, tell him, listen, it's great that, that this book is coming. Let me know if I can do anything about it. And that was just gorgeous because, you know, she really certainly had no idea about now. And that that was really kind of feeling that we have been able to bring something back of what happens here. Mm. At the same time, one has to say, she clearly had a clear idea what my job would be. So if she understood for this moment of understanding that I would be a gallerist, she would have this thing like, well, you're my gallerist. Oh, you did this show in Germany. Okay. Well, you know, I want you making good sales. Yeah? Do you understand? So, I mean, yes. things like that. You've got a clear thing to do. Um, and actually, having this success, I have to say, I'm very happy that we did have sales and such a lot of interest, and that for two reasons became to be very important. One reason is that she ever since would print photos for her exhibitions or for collect collectors who would like to purchase something. But since her body of work was so wide, she couldn't do all of them in, in, in an edition. She never did editions. First, but on the other uh, side, I mean, she couldn't afford to make so many Dutch ones. She never ever did any other printing technique for color points. So having the success also meant not only supplying for her money she would need to live, but also being able to make her making new choices of works she would like to have printed, mm -hmm. and she did that. And that was a crazy thing that she would be so aware about her work, about the body of her work. And um, so, with it, just bring it back to the dumb boy. And if anyone has any questions, please, you know, just jump in. I was sorry. I was wondering how long she actually spent here. Um, like how long did it take her to put the project together? And where she stayed when she was here? She came to Dublin in autumn, um, in winter, uh, nineteen sixty-five. And uh, must have stayed here until 1966. 
Uh, if we listen to Anna, it had been some weeks. If we um, understand, we can't prove it. We would have to go back into her diaries. Um, but understanding how she worked in other for her other books, she normally would spend something like half a year in in town, and for quite a long time she wouldn't go around with camera. She would be with us, just to get get the place, to understand the place. And actually, it said that she started work on architecture here in Dublin, but soon, and if you compare the books, which you can because they are all down downstairs, you see that the Dublin book inherits a lot of portraits, much more portraits than all the other books do. And this is because she identified the most important thing about and in Dublin are the people. Mm -hmm. And she liked the people, she got along with them, and the people got along with her. So. She had, she had that quote when she talked about the architecture and people had said to her that Dublin was the most, one of the most beautiful cities either in Europe and the world and, and she was going, I don't agree with this, yeah. but for me it is the people. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's very, it very kind of nice and unusual. So you had a question. You, um, I was going to ask about where these uh, prints were printed, but you mentioned that they were scanned from uh, original prints, not from the original, the original prints. On the walls. They are all original prints, so it's a scan. Mm -hmm. I've been done for the book. Oh, for the book, sorry. For, yes. for our original prints, yes. which is quite a lot of effort. And where were these have been done in Germany? Um, and where was used print together with her? So he would not only be out in, in locations for making photos, but also be in the, uh, the um, lab and producing black and white prints. Mm -hmm. And at the end of her life, he would do that on, her, uh, on his own, but being judged, photos being bitterly judged by Evelyn and she could be quite sharp. Um, the dye transfer process she would do mainly with Guy Strichers, who used to work in New York <coughs> and who is the one who also produces the or produced the works for Virgin Eggleston. So dye transfer is something some photographers are able to do that. I just spoke to a man yesterday here in Dublin who did that something in the seventies. It's an extreme um, time consuming hand crafting work. You, you seem to know a little bit about well, it. I know it's considered. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not only that you, it's that you have to have the paper, which they could have stopped to, uh, to produce the paper in 92. So, up to, I, I, I wonder if there is still a piece of paper available. I think it's about now that, that there is nothing available anymore, but at the same time the quality of archival pigment point became to be very good. So okay. so that's a lot to do with the value of, of the works, the, so the, with, with the black and white silver gelatin prints, these were all printed within her lifetime and yes. there won't be any more? No, we have some prints in here which had not been printed during her life. So the print on the right side, beside the uh, from, from Dublin, is a lighter print, which had been done specifically for you for your exhibition. Okay. It's not signed, and it would not be considered of being a print of hers. And would so Andreas have printed that? Or yeah. Or, yeah. Andreas. Yeah. So he would know precisely how she wanted it. Why? Because for those who aren't photographers, there is a lot of. Um, different techniques you can bring to the darkrooms which really affect the look and feel of a picture. So it's yeah. very, very, even though people think a camera takes, takes an exact picture of the world, it's actually very, very subjective and can really affect what you see. So that's kind of yeah. important to remember that she's very much chosen to have this very, very dark, moody kind of a palette with Dublin. I mean, I have this, I have this deepness and this ways and, and so on. I mean, it's really uh, something. One gorgeous thing about Evelyn is that she not, was not only great in making photographs of people, but she also had the capability of doing all the different kinds of styles, interiors, the lives, landscape, city photographs, architecture, mm. all those different types which come to be very specific aspects of single photographers nowadays. Um, she inherited this ability um, and <coughs> During, I mean, she she really was somebody who was, as Andrea said before, she was hard with herself as well. So she could have prob probably a much easier life if she just had decided to go with C print, <coughs> normal color print, 
for the colorful clothes because that's inexpensive. A dye transfer is really expensive to, to be done. So by the success her work would have, we were able to finance more dye transfer she would decide on. We would develop this process. You know, ordering a dye transfer now means, I mean, if there would be any, that we possibly get the first one in three years. Wow. So, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just, you can't believe it. Photography became to be so fast that that seems to be a contradiction. Yeah. Of this technique. yeah. But she, she went on and she, because she never did anything like that, Guy Strichert never would refuse any wish of hers. I mean, he always would do what she wanted. And he did refuse quite a lot of photographs. He would go, like to, to work with him. And with the Dublin work, there's more more images in the book that are yeah. in the show, and are there many more images than that you've seen that aren't in the book? No, I mean, um, I'm I'm sorry that I can't recall the precise number, but uh, if the book has something like 100, 120 photos, she possibly had as as an image. So I mean, having this people here. She possibly would have a second image of this, but it's most likely that she would have two or three um, transparency of one image. Mm -hmm. And they have slightly different things in light, but certainly two of them would be almost similar to each other because she, go, she went for security, having that. So for each image, we possibly now for, for transparencies or negatives. So. Um, if one goes back into the archive, she possibly had something like 200 prints or images on each so image, yeah. and then some more negatives out of that. <coughs> she really was kind of precise. Yeah. So, and then I, this mean, I mean, if I mean, if you know photography now, you have all these digital cameras. Your work is to get rid of all what you don't need. I mean, afterwards, she did that before. Mm. And that maybe the lack of money and, and the cumbersome nature of the camera were all stacked in. I think it was also yeah. 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 She she got this German based education and she she had this very wide background of humanistic education. And I think that all is due to I mean, just look at that. You certainly have very great photos. If you if you consider the photos upstairs from New York, they're really kind of uh, street uh, photography like mm -hmm. pictures. She photographed at the same time as Eggleston, and you would not compare them because Eggleston is really avant garde art, and she is strictly classical. Mm -hmm. Strictly classical. And if you look to her very early photos and look to her very late photos, you would not necessarily say that there is something like change or development or new ideas or so. No, no. What there is is a change of our dresses, a change of style, a change of the fashion of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes that we can consider this is a photo of the 60s and not of, of 80s. But the style of her photogra photography did not change. In a way. You really can compare it as something like a strict wet line. That way. A very strong vision. And then maybe we're very we're running out of time, so just if we could just finish maybe and then it's more questions, please please jump in. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk about her influences in photography? Her influences? The photographers who might have influenced her? Well one possibly could say Augustana oh, yeah, possibly did. Yeah, um, she um, she had a relation which was Roger Blindman. She lived in New York. She was friend with Saul Steinberg. You, you see this portrait mm -hmm. upstairs. Um, well, it's no, you wouldn't really say that she had just. But it's obviously, I mean, just looking at just the ones here, the ones I've seen, and you'd immediately think of August Sanders generation, what? Bill Brandt, yeah. not Bill her Brandt, generation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She also made a conscious <laughs> choice to re sort of reject the post Robert Frank documentary yeah. style yeah. and just stick to this early 20th right. century yeah. objective kind of thing. But also maybe her magazine work influenced yes. that as well, you yeah, know. That I mean, she had been a real interested, uh, highly, um, um, yeah, very much respected uh, magazine photographer for, for uh, many, many important uh, magazines based on photographic art. 
take me for what it brought to mind. <coughs> she really got very well paid for that and had her funding. And that. Oh, that means in the 50s and 60s, what no, time? No, no, she, yeah. she arrived in New York in 46. Okay. And she would make a career as a fashion photographer. And um, someone, someone said, listen, Evelyn, please, we ask you to make photos of the marriage dresses, not photos of the marriages. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that was, she hated it. Yeah. And we, I do know some of her work from that, but uh, um, she, her, actually her very, very first book is not known at all. It was a book about Mexico. She hated Mexico. For some reasons, I don't know why. Um, possibly because of one style of man. So, yeah. not proper for her. Um, so, it happens that I bought for quite a lot of money one copy of, of the Mexico book. It's rare. And then I, she came over to Bochum and um, I bought all my books I, I collected and presented them to her and asked her to sign them. And I just said, oh, how stupid, I forgot one book. And she said, which one? I said, oh, I forgot the Mexico book. And she said, oh, how sad. I would destroy it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily I forgot that. Yeah. But um, I mean, that is how she, how she was in a way. Yeah. And then towards the end of her life, she was making still lives. Yeah. yeah. I think we could consider her a still life work from 96 to 97, 8. Um, eight still lives she did as the last body of work, and that was something which she did completely independently, no, no com consignment had been done on that. And those are really stunning. It's a little pity that we, um, you all should work on getting an extension of this gallery. <laughs> Just Donations take help. it as a as <laughs> consignment from Evelyn Hofer, you know, so you do what this lady wants to have this tiny little space for some more additional still life photos. Yeah. Oh, we it's just a few on the bridge up here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, those are beautiful too, but the still lives, the real classical food still lives. You see them in the book. Oh, so that is the last body of work she would do. And she was doing that right up until the end, was she? So she would stop working and wasn't really capable of doing yeah. that. She got her uh, operation on, on her own heart and Andres told me that Somewhere after that operation, her mind really lost its ability to remember. She got, um, she got this problem. And then she died in Mexico, which she may not have been very happy about then. Well, she ever since um, believed that she was at the house of her sister, who is some years older. Uh, she's now 91. She's a professor of veterinary medicine, and she still goes to university every single working day. Um, so, uh, I think we have to do that yeah. and she would, Alina would take Evelyn in, and so Andreas really took a lot of effort to make her life comfortable and possible in New York, in her studio, which was her life. Yeah. She loved to be there, um, but she it would be impossible. I mean, so she would go to Mexico, believing, believing there very soon because she was there only for holiday. Ah, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. So she really didn't understand. What was impossible. So Andreas and Alina, her sister, really made her late years quite nice and happy. Great. Yeah. Has anyone got any last questions? Yes. I was just wondering, how did the Dublin project come about in the first place? And when she got here, or to any city um, that she was unfamiliar with, how did she navigate herself around from, say, Glasnevin to Jan Janus or to the High Court judge? Did she just get lost and wander, or did she have I think, um, well, she had been consigned for doing such books. She did New York, she did Washington, London, and she did um, a book on Paris, which never had been realized, never printed. Um, Dublin, of course, she did a book on Spain, the old times and gone. And brilliant books, if you look to the printing technique, just marvelous. And also, I mean, all the big books, really great books for that time, and even today. Um, so she had been consigned for that. But um, as Andrea said, she would arrive and live here, be here, and make her make her acquaintances. And as I said yesterday at the opening, if you, I, I you know I met Andrea Stein, who 
whom I got to know because she started to, to fall in love with Evelyn Hofer's photo. So I met her because of Evelyn. And as it happens, I mean, you just connected with that man, for example, in a very different way. And that is why we have these personal portraits. And you, you have a different type of portraits for the Dublin book because she really started to develop personal relations. And one thing, one relation leads to the other. And I can tell you it happens today. I mean, that, that's my personal experience. I was with her until yesterday. And I assume, I assume that this had been similar to her. And then, of course, Dublin is a big town, but it's not big as other big towns. So you make your way to see places, to Maryland Park, for example, or Jenny's, or whatever. I mean, um, and she's quite fond of this body of work, wasn't she? I know that, that uh, George McCullough was, was saying that she sent a print to Glass mm -hmm. Levin mm -hmm. um, just 25 yeah. years ago. Anna has a, tr has a print uh, too. It's, it's just a, a copy. I think yeah. Copy of the yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's not. It's not a print. Oh, yes. The question is Could you please say something uh, to uh, about your relation to other photographers and their work? I don't think that she ever belonged to a photographic scene now, uh, as we know it nowadays. I mean, Angel is building up such a scene, and we know that all the photographic people have. Uh, they gather together and have these relations between each other and so on. I mean, she never belonged to that. But there, there might be influences. I see a lot of Zander in them. That's what we said before, that August, I, I've had the question, um, I answered the question, who could have influenced her work, who, was a, who might have been uh, important to her. The only one I certainly would say is August Sander, for example, for, for, for many reasons. And that uh, she would say too that she was much more related, for example, with the work of Richard Lindner, who, who for whom she would do studies for, for his uh, paintings. And the very first painting which had been bought by the MoMA of Richard Lindner, she's portrait. She, you would find her sitting on this big painting. You find her sitting on the left side in front, looking like a little schoolgirl, while all this Richard Lindner bodies, I mean physical bodies, appear on that picture, and she would have made the studies for those people, for which I don't know. They had a relationship. And she was quite good friend with Saul Steinberg. Mm. Well, very involved with the artistic scene, but not much more. Yeah. Yeah, 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 much more, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and she's an excellent colorist, so I think that possibly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. She is excellent in composition and color and light, and I mean, in so many senses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if there's no, if there's no last questions, we're way over to try. Okay, I tried to answer. Or, that um, I just wonder if you selected to be asked for third. Is that the publishers? I, I didn't who answer. Who chose the writer for the text of the double? The second one, I think this came out of the editor's work, and um, now and then I meet people who have been. Uh, in charge with Evelyn Hofer for their magazines and so, but that is certainly something which came out. I know it for the first book, Florence. Um, Mary McCarthy, who was already a very well known writer, was had the consignment commission to, to make this Florence book, and she wanted to have an unknown photographer that this person would do what she wanted. She was very worldly, Evelyn. Who, who did what she wanted herself, <laughs> certainly. And uh, I think they, they didn't like each other very much for that, but I mean, the book is beautiful. And it's very much on architecture, by the way. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, why did she get to that one? I mean, I mean what did like, um, somebody say, told, uh, told her, just go there if you want to go city, or put it more like, um, she had an idea, what, what can I do next or something? Well, as I said, it was a commission. Uh, book publisher decided to have this this books on cities. It's serious. You see that there is a clue behind it. So um, they look for cities. So Paris should have been among them, but never uh, had been finished. Though we know the photos of Paris. It's, it's, you can see some of them in the uh, book from 2004. Okay. Sorry, we're way over, so we usually don't have talk, but it's been so absolutely fascinating. This, uh, speaking on behalf of us here in the gallery, this has just been the most wonderful experience because we have known about Hofer's work, but we just did, 